block number two for electricity. The first item is the resistance of a wire. This equation right down here has one use. It is to find the resistance of a length of wire. So if you have wire length L in meters with a cross-sectional area A in square meters, uh, and if you know what the material is made out of, remember this resistivity value, which is measured in ohm meters, is specific to every material. So you would need to look those values up on the reference table. The only real curveball that can be thrown at you is if they don't give you the cross-sectional area, if they give you the radius of a circular cross-section of wire, you would have to find the cross-sectional area by doing pi r squared. So why don't you pause the video and calculate the resistance of a copper wire with a cross-sectional area of 4.2 times 10 to the negative 6 square meters and a length of 15 meters. All right. I skipped the equation because it's right here, but here's our substitution with units. This is the resistivity value for copper off the reference table, and it's 15 meters long. And I divided by the cross-sectional area, 4.2 times 10 to the negative 6 square meters. Now, you don't have to hit the squared button on your calculator because this is the area. You're not doing pi r squared. Even though it's in square meters, that means somebody has already calculated the area for you. So you should get about 0 0.061 ohms. The biggest part of review block two are series and parallel circuits. So here are the rules directly off the reference table. That's, they could be found on the electricity page of your reference table, and hopefully still on your reference table in between the series and parallel rules, you have written V total equals I total R total, V1 equals I1 R1, and so on. And these are the three rules that apply to series circuits. If you have resistors in series, um, you would add up their resistance to get the total or equivalent, remember that's sometimes REQ, the total or equivalent resistance. And all of the potential differences, remember we call them potential drops because you gain potential difference at the battery and you lose it at the resistors. So if I were to put a meter in here across the first resistor to measure V1, that would be a drop in potential. Whereas if I put a voltmeter across the battery, uh, this would measure what we call V total and this would be a gain in potential. What you gain at the battery, you must lose out in the circuit at all the resistors, hence the rule, V total equals V1 plus V2 plus V3. And all of the currents in a series circuit, no matter where you put an ammeter, if I put an ammeter here to measure I total, or I could put an ammeter near the second resistor to measure I2, these are, of course, only ammeters if you put the A inside of them, and that's a voltmeter. Uh, all of the currents should be the same. Now, be careful with this rule. This doesn't say that you can't change the current in a series circuit. Of course, you can change the current. You can take a bigger battery or add another resistor, and all of that will change I total. What this rule really says is no matter where you measure the current in a given series circuit, you will always get the same value. If you make a change to the circuit, such as increase the battery potential difference, then all of these values, I1, I2, I3, and I total, will all be the same as each other, but they'll be larger than they were before. So here's a quick example for you to try. Um, why don't you put the video on pause and draw a series circuit with two 40 ohm resistors and a 120 volt battery, not a cell. And you want to draw it and calculate the following four things. So put the video on pause and sketch that out on scrap paper. All right, let's see how you did. Here's our series circuit. We have two <clears throat> 40 ohm resistors and we have the voltmeter inserted uh, to measure the voltage across resistor one and we have the ammeter in to measure uh, I total. Now, of course, since all the currents are the same, we could have put the ammeter anywhere, but that's how I've drawn it. Now we need to calculate R total. If you look at your rules, R total is R1 plus R2 and you have two 40 ohm resistors in series, so that gets us to a total of 80 ohms. I total, this is where you have to rely on the uh, Ohm's law. I total uh, will be equal to V total over R total. Of course, R total is R equivalent. So if we do uh, 120 volts, which is V total, divided by 
80 ohms, which is our total, that will give us 1.5 amps of current. Now that would also be the answer to I1 or I2 if that were the question, because all the I's are the same. Now the potential drop across resistor one, that's what's being measured here with this voltmeter. And we can't use our rule because we don't know V1 or V2, but we do know V total is 120 volts. Uh, so what we can do is use Ohm's law. V1 equals I1 R1, I1 R1. And hopefully you're not thinking, we don't know I1. Yes, we do. All the currents are the same. So that's 1.5 amps times R1 is 40 ohms. That gets us to, uh, oops, that gets us to a 60 volt drop. And V2, well, it's going to be uh, equal to I2 R2. And R2 is the same as R1, and I1 is the same as I2. Uh, so that also gets us 60 volts. Now that also is interesting because it satisfies our rule that V1 plus V2 should be equal to V total, and there we see that. All right, parallel circuits, slightly more complicated than series circuits. The best way to think of it is that when the current flows out of the battery, it's going to reach what's called a junction, where the current has a choice. Here, some of the electrons would take a left, and flow up through the resistor and some would continue straight. So if we were to put a meter in here, an ammeter, we'd be measuring I total. Whereas if we put meters in these branches, we'd be measuring I1, I2, and I3 respectively. So the current is gonna branch, which it didn't do before. That's where this rule comes from. The total current will be equal to the sum of the individual currents going down the branches. Now the potential differences, the best way to think about it is our battery voltage V total. Uh, each of these resistors is essentially wired right to the battery. They're not sharing the battery like they were in series. Each of these resistors feels like it owns the battery. It's connected right to the terminals of the battery without having to go through uh, any other resistors. So all of the potential differences are going to be the same as the battery potential difference, which is why your house is wired in parallel because everything in your house relies on 120 volts, and that's essentially what we would call the total potential difference of the house. And without a doubt, the most confusing rule is the equivalent resistance. When you put resistors in parallel, you have to use this one over equation, one over R1 plus one over R2 plus one over R3, then you need to flip it. That gets you the, you need to remember to flip at the end. This is not REQ, it's uh, one over REQ uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, that's where we use the x to the negative one button on your calculator, the inverse button on your calculator. So why don't we give it a try? We have to draw uh, a parallel circuit with a 20 and 30 ohm resistor with a 120 volt battery. And you need a voltmeter to measure the potential difference across the 20 and an ammeter to measure the current through the 30 and then you have five quantities to calculate. So why don't you pause the video, take a moment, and try that. All right, let's see how you did. Here's what the circuit should look like. Here's a parallel circuit, and we have a 20 ohm resistor with a voltmeter reading the potential across it, and we have a 30 ohm resistor, and we have an ammeter, this would be I2, uh, measuring the current through the 30 ohm resistor. Now we have a few things to calculate. This is probably the most important, getting that equivalent or total resistance when you have a 20 and a 30. You would do the one over REQ is one over 20 ohms plus one over 30 ohms. So what you would do with your calculator, you would hit 20, then the inverse button, that's one over 20, then you would hit plus, and you would type 30, inverse button, then you would hit enter, and you will get a number. Then, if you hit the inverse button again, your calculator screen will say answer inverse, which is what you want. This is flipping over the answer and you will get 12 ohms. That is the equivalent resistance when you put a 20 ohm and a 30 ohm resistor in parallel. Now remember one of our rules of thumb is that the equivalent resistance will always be smaller than the smallest resistor. And here our smallest resistor is a 20 ohm resistor, so this makes perfect sense that we get a 12 ohm equivalent resistance. Now, I total, 
We can't use the rule because we don't know I1 and I2, but we can do I total is V total over R total or REQ as the case may be. REQ, well, V total is 120 volts and our uh, R equivalent is 12 ohms. So that gets us to 10 amps. That's a really high current. So 10 amps of current will flow out of this battery and travel along and then it's gonna split. So when we get our answers to I1 and R2, I2, our hope is that they add to 10 amps because that definitely needs to happen. Well, I1 is gonna be V1 uh, over R1. And we know both of those values because all of the Vs are the same. So this 120 volts is also V1. So we're gonna have 120 volts over 20 ohms and that will get us six amps of current and for i2 we're going to do v2 over r2 which is now 30 ohms and we will get four amps of current four amps so there you have it our i2 and our i1 add to i total uh, which was the 10 amps and v2 that's by far the easiest part of this question if you look at the rule all the v's are the same so since you were given v total in the problem you know V2 is going to be 120 volts. Matter of fact, you couldn't have done the last part of the question without knowing that. All right, power. Power is the rate at which work is done or uh, energy is used. And that's probably more important uh, in the electrical unit is that we're, you know, uh, electrical devices uh, when you plug them in, are using electrical energy. So uh, that's probably a more important definition than the rate at which work is done. So it's the rate at which energy is used. And if you look at the reference table, you have a small buffet of equations here. Uh, P equals IV equals I squared R equals V squared over R. Uh, how do you know which one to use? Well, you just, you know, write down your knowns and unknowns and uh, uh, use the proper equation. Now, electrical energy, the hardest part of that is the symbol. We think of W as work, but if you look at the reference table in the electricity section, it says W is work or electrical energy. So which equations can we use? Well, your reference table, New York State reference table, has uh, W equals PT equals IVT equals I squared RT equals V squared over RT. So there's your buffet for electrical energy. Notice it also involves time. The time needs to be in seconds because, um, well, power is measured in watts, which is joules per second, if we were to use this first equation here. And if you multiply that by seconds, the seconds will cancel and you'll be left with joules for electrical energy, which is what it's measured in. But you can't put minutes here because you could see that the minutes would not cancel with the seconds. All right, a quick example. You might want to pause the video and uh, and figure out the uh, figure out the power of the circuit and the electrical energy. Now it appears when I tried this example, uh, I used uh, mistakenly 100 volts instead of 1,000 volts. I didn't have my reading glasses on, so when you work it, why don't you put 100 volts there? So give the video a pause and work those out. All right, so which equation would we pick to find the power? Well, we have uh, V total. By the way, we're looking for total power, so that's P total. Um, we know V total, that's easy. And we can also get R total pretty easily. If you use the parallel rule on your calculator, you should be getting that the equivalent resistance of three 100 ohm resistors would be 33 and a third. So 33.3. Uh, ohms is going to be our equivalent resistance. So I would use the equation P equals V squared over R. And I would use the totals to do that. So you're going to have 100 volts squared over 33.3 ohms. And that gets us to 300 watts of power. Now, how much energy will be used in one minute? <clears throat> well, we could use uh, we're looking for W, electrical energy. 
uh, we could use v squared over rt, but why would we do that since we just did v squared over rt? So I would use the very first equation in the buffet, w equals pt, and the power is 300 watts, and you multiply by 60 seconds because you don't want to use the one minute, you need to convert it to seconds, and that will get us 18,000, and that's going to be in joules because we're looking at electrical energy. All right, Kirchhoff's first law, or Kirchhoff's law, uh, is quite simple. It comes into play in parallel circuits, not series circuits. And it says that the current, all of the currents entering a junction must equal the sum of all the currents leaving a junction, or simply I in equals I out. So a very quick example here, I only see one current into the junction by looking at the arrowhead. We have 11 amps of current flowing into the junction. And we have two currents flowing away from the junction. It's like a T intersection. All the cars either have to go left or right after entering from the right-hand side there. So we have four amps flowing away from the junction, yet we have 11 amps flowing in, uh, which tells us that, that this one must be seven amps. And if we do that, seven plus four is 11, 11 away and 11 in. And that uh, that helps to make the current in equal the current out, and we now know I2. All right, a little bit of magnetism. Um, first, a couple of facts about magnetism. The way you create a magnet, you have to have moving electric charges. So you might have orbiting electrons in a permanent magnet, like the kind that sticks to your fridge. They're moving. moving. And you also might have um, electrons moving in a wire. Uh, if you have uh, connected a circuit back in class, or you have a lamp on that you're reading next to you right now. Um, that wire would become magnetic because you have moving electrons. So anytime you have a moving electric charge, whether it be a proton or an electron, you will have a magnet. And magnets are not charged, even though sometimes people say they are. They are not charged. They don't have charges. Magnets have poles. Uh, specifically, uh, magnets have north and south poles. There are four primary ferromagnetic materials. That would be iron. Iron is by far the most common. Iron, nickel, cobalt, and gadolinium, but iron is normally what we work with in almost all magnetism. Uh, magnetic field lines uh, run from north to south. I like to say like old people in the winter, they go from north to south. So when you put an arrow on your magnetic field lines, they should always be pointing away from north poles and towards south poles. And there's no such thing as a magnetic monopole. So even if you have a magnet with a north and a south and you break it in half, you will end up with um, a north and a south on each of your pieces after the break. All right, magnetic field lines, you should be able to sketch them around a regular old bar magnet. Um, and probably more commonly um, around multiple magnets. So here we have a north and a south. And remember, um, the way you test a magnetic field is you pretend to put a little north pole down. So the little north pole would zip across this gap. And the arrowhead is going to point, as we just said, from north to south, like old people in the winter. And that arrowhead would look like that. And this arrowhead would look like this. And I guess they would start to bow around like this. But typically, you just have to draw a couple. It's very important to make sure your field lines uh, start on one magnet and end on the other. And the SS or the NN are the ones that have sort of the repelling looking lines that will look like this. You have pictures of all the sketches you're responsible for in your uh, review book. So these kind of go like this. And remember, every field line that you draw needs an arrowhead. So away from the north or, and toward the south. So you're going to put arrows on these guys all pointing in toward the S poles. All right, one last idea. Electromagnetic induction, if you're moving a wire near a magnet or a magnet near a wire, you will get a current to flow. Uh, that's called electromagnetic induction. The faster you move the wire, the more current you'll get. But if you take a wire and pull it through magnetic field lines of a magnet, you're going to get a potential difference and hence a current to flow. We like to say you need relative motion between a magnet and a coil. So you could be moving the magnet, or you could be moving the coil of wire, or you could be moving both. As long as there is relative motion between the two, you will get a current and hence a potential difference. The wire also needs to cut magnetic field lines. If you're following the field lines with the wire, you won't get any current to flow. But if you're cutting the field lines with the wire, 
uh, you will get some current to flow. So it's often helpful to draw in the magnetic field lines um, before you do an induction problem. Hope you enjoyed.